Coming up on this week's show, Rockstar patch over 100 bugs in the GTA Trilogy collection. For portable Sega Saturn. And we get tips on keeping our retro machines alive with Jan Vita. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now check out Commodore 64, a visual compendium, celebrating one of the most popular home computers ever and taking you on a journey into its wonderful and varied gaming library. You can order it right now and even get a free pair of Sonic socks if you order before Christmas. You'll find that and lots more on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. And with our friends at PCBWay, who offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards. They also do stuff like 3D printing and injection molding, and they're big supporters of the retro community. You can get an instant quote for your project right now at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 305, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. Look at this well into December now. And I appreciate as well that this time of year is usually a very busy time for a lot of people. You might be rushing around doing Christmas shopping. You might have Christmas parties on, depending on which part of the world you're in. You might be off to see friends and family. You know, one thing that's really good about podcasts is you can take them anywhere with you. Yeah, and you, you, you've been away from from everything, really, haven't you, recently, Dan? Uh, in, a, in a kind of technological black hole. <laughs> well, I did. I had to drive up to um, North Yorkshire, up on the moors for a couple of days, which for uh, people not in the UK, that is right in the wilderness. So it was my birthday over the weekend. Bearing in mind on my birthday around two years ago before COVID hit, I went to London to Ministry of Sound Clubbing. Now, having a dog, we did a little uh, trip to um, the North Yorkshire moors in a cottage. I think my life's changed quite a bit. You're getting older, Dan. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. It was amazing. And we were driving up the motorway and I had a load of podcasts playing and our friends at... Um, Retro Asylum recently did their 10-year anniversary episode, which is crazy. Had that on in the car, checked out um, Arcade Attack's latest episode on the way back as well. So, you know, it's great to listen to podcasts when you're out and about, um, even though I didn't have any data at all or any signal on my phone for the last um, four days. So um, it's actually a bit of a novelty being back to uh, civilization and having some internet connectivity now, I've got to say. It, it did make me laugh because, like, obviously our group chat, usually the three of us, we pretty much talk to each other pretty much every hour of the day don't we yeah yeah and it was just like after like two days like dan would pop up like i'm in a calf i'm in a pub <laughs> like, I've got I, I can just imagine him sitting there sweating <laughs> like, getting withdrawals you know? it was there was one moment we got lost on the north yorkshire moors and i said to samantha i was like i'll just get google maps up and let no signal oh my god what we're we gonna do luckily we had to look at street signs really old oh wow god, get the <laughs> so, atlas uh, out mate <laughs> <laughs> i will say one thing though I took my Nintendo Switch to the cottage with me, you know, while Samantha was getting ready and that on an evening. Uh, got through a lot of Quake on oh, the yeah. Switch, played that for hours and hours. A lot of the Mega Drive games that are on there as well, I paid for another 20 quid down premium service. Some of the N64 games as well. So I've done quite a bit of gaming, even though I've been away, you know, uh, kind of getting back to nature this weekend. But. Well, your your machines haven't kind of rotted, have they, uh, while she have been gone and, and not been maintained? No, I think my um, my little console collection in here is all in pretty good working order at the moment. Although, nice little segue there, Ravi, because we have got an amazing guest this week who's going to give us some tips on keeping our retro machines, our retro consoles, retro computers, even stuff like um, CRT monitors. We talk about maintaining them with them as well, don't we? This is Jan Beta, who is one of my favourite kind of techie YouTubers who really goes in depth on how to do repairs and keep these old systems up and running. Yeah, I love his channel because... You know, he admits that he's no expert in this, but over the time he's picked up a hell of a lot of knowledge. So he he says he'll make the mistakes so you don't have to. So it's great to kind of yeah. check out his channel because, you know, he's got quite an in-depth knowledge about what goes wrong. And there's all sorts of stuff like clipping the right batteries out and, you know, making sure that you can keep these machines alive and uh, they don't wreck themselves as well. I know, Joe, you recently got um, an original Xbox, didn't you? recently ish uh, yeah where's this going <laughs> have you um took that capacitor out of there you know the, the battery that <laughs> leaks the clock one? no i haven't and both of you have both been at me um and i haven't done it no and i am worried about it leaking but it did remind me to kind of like check all my game boys and game boy advances yeah. and even my links which 
I am ashamed to say did have the, you know, double A batteries still sat in there. Um, so luckily I did get them out. Um, I have been stung by that before with a Wii remote of all things mm. with, you know, normal kind of like double A batteries or triple A batteries, whatever it was leaking. So I do really need to look at that Xbox. Um, so we're going to have to rip it lesson. apart, Joe, and uh, get in that. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to if I want it to work in a couple of years' time. Well, that's the thing. So a lot of these systems, particularly, I mean, we talk more about this with Jan very soon. Mm. There was kind of an era where particularly early surface mount capacitors, they were really badly made. And pretty much all of them from that kind of early-ish 90s, about 92, 93, up until around the mid-2000s, a lot of them had it. It was called the capacitor plague, wasn't Mm. it? Well, you know, the, the, the biggest one I see is, you know, it never even crossed my mind with consoles is old Nintendo and Game Boy games, you know, like NES and Game Boy games, you know, the amount of times, you know, Pokemon games are really hot. That when you mm. buy them, they say like, oh, the, you know, the battery's been replaced on them, you know, or the battery hasn't been replaced. You have to replace it yourself and stuff like that. So, you know, I never really thought about it from a console perspective, whereas it is just as likely for them to die or leak and stuff as well, isn't it? So, And also like, you know, these companies never fought people in 30 years are going to be using the same pieces of hardware still. So they probably had like a little life span in them and then, yeah, it all goes to rubbish. So you really need to investigate and uh, get some good tips on maintaining stuff. Yeah, and I mean, you're probably like us guys. I mean, you know, we've got systems that are not set up all the time. Due to lack of space, I've got a few machines in the cupboard that I might bring out, God, maybe once every two years or something. And then you don't want to get that surprise that suddenly it's not working. So it's a good little reminder, just on these little tips, you know, to keep your retro systems alive and what to look out for. And power supplies as well. That's a big one that we talk about with him because, you know, a lot of those power supplies that are aging now, not good to plug into your old machines if they're going to suddenly, um, you know, send surges of electricity through them and destroy the, the motherboards. The smell of burning dust when you plug them in. Oh, yeah, <laughs> not nice. So all that and a lot more as well. And I mean, the first 20 minutes of this interview, it's a nice nostalgic chat because um, Jan grew up in Germany. So we'll kind of talk about the computer scene there as well and magazines, a bit about kind of, you know, playground piracy, kind of what it was like over there. So I think you're going to enjoy this week's guest. Our special guest, Jan Bieter, is coming up on the show in around 25 minutes from now. Now, one thing I was playing quite a bit when I was away over the weekend, um, I had about two or three hours actually playing Vice City on the Switch. And of course, we did talk about this when um, the collection dropped a few weeks ago, um, the new Grand Theft Auto trilogy, that it had a load of bugs on there and there was that massive backlash. Um, Grand Theft Auto, the trilogy, definitive edition to give it its full title, which I still think is one of the most ridiculous names I've heard for a collection of games. But now, as we predicted, Rockstar, not only did they apologise for all the problems with the game as well, but they've put out a patch in the last week that fixes a whopping 117 bugs in the games. That is a hell of a lot of bugs to fix. Mm. But it's quite funny because as Ravi pointed out when we were doing putting the news together earlier on is, you know, the fan base already fixed it. Like straight yeah. away. Like yeah, I saw immediately I saw a bug fix for the rain effect. That yeah. that came out like a mod straight away from yeah. the fan community. But um yeah. I don't know, were we too harsh on it or um what was it like? You know what? Uh, I, I, actually, from well, from what I, I mean, you know, just in terms of general reaction, because obviously we recorded our show. I think it was like the day after it landed, yeah. so we were pretty early with that story. But then I watched a load of videos and stuff over the weekend after, and I actually think we were quite mild on the game compared to how in some people have gone. But I've actually played them, and I played um, a bit of GTA 3. I played a good few hours on Vice City. And actually, at the time recording this show, this new update that fixes a lot of the problems is only for the PlayStation, Xbox, and the PC versions. It's not made its way to the Switch yet. So I'm still playing, you know, the original release on the Switch. And, I mean, I enjoyed it because it was, you know, I was playing Vice City, and it was the only console I had at the time, and I was away. But there were definitely problems with it. I mean, I, I, I saw some of the bugs on there where, you know, the frame rate kind of went down to around, it looked like around 10 frames a second it's, in it's, some parts of the game. It's a weird culture now of releasing broken stuff. And I kind of get it. It's like, I my guess is like, you know, someone comes around to your house to paint it and you they go oh i'm finished and then you come in and you go it's not really finished isn't it and then the big boss comes in and he goes right finish it off tomorrow and yeah i think it's like they probably didn't have the budget or the allocation they just had to release it and the people were going no it's it's not 
not finish. And then as soon as all the negative press came out, they were like, right, here's some more money, patch it. You know, <laughs> it's that kind of idea of a, a broken release. But, you know, it just does such damage to your reputation yeah. and really lets the fans down as well because that's the point that they're really looking forward to it, you know. Uh, and and I think you've you hit the nail on the head there with there's like a culture of it. Like it seems to be like, I wouldn't say it's acceptable, but we're just seeing it so much with games recently. Like maybe not so like, not like, oh yeah, this happened last week or this happened, you know, last month, but like the Tony Hawk's game, not the remastered pro, you know, one and two, but the one before that, I think it was pro skater five or six. I can't remember, but it came Mm. out like five years ago. And that was exactly the same. Like the game literally just didn't work. And then there was like a, um, you know, WWE wrestling game, you you know, one of the, I, I, once again, I'm not too familiar with them, but it was the Switch one, like the 2020 version or something. And it was just like a complete unplayable mess. And like, these are big brand, big names. It's not like indie publishers that they're putting it out and, you know, they're like, oh God, well, we've run out of money, so we've got to put it out. It is massive, you know, it's rock star. But yeah, and I, well, you, you say you say that though, and it wasn't actually them that made this. This was um, it's a studio called Grove Street Games. Yeah, who are actually the race? They've only got twenty one employees. They're a small company um, based in Florida, and they're the ones that actually did a lot. That I mean, their main bread and butter is making mobile ports of games. So really, I think this <laughs> which was is what probably they did. quite an ambition. <laughs> and yeah, well, they, they actually did the mobile versions of Grand Theft Auto, which really it looks like all they've done is kind of give them a bit of a lick of paint for, you know, this kind of re-release. And it seems yeah. like uh, something that the managers would kind of do. You know, I mean, the devs could sit there and develop a game forever and it's probably, you know, not their fault. But I can imagine managers just going, just get it out. It's not done, boss. Just get it out, you know. And it's yeah. it's that kind of thing where it's like, come on, guys, wait one more week or just patch it a little bit more so it's got that beautiful release. But then we're in that, we're in that update culture, aren't we? So... What's this kind of update bought then? It's uh, well, a lot, 15, of, lot of patches, isn't it? <laughs> 15 of the bug fixes of the 117 are just sorting out the rain, apparently. <laughs> so, so the rain. There, there is one moment I saw it raining inside. There you the go. Game. Yeah. So 15 bugs for the raining, like patched out. Um, apparently quite a lot of it. It's like misspellings in like the text and in like, the... Like, not just in the text, but apparently like in in like signs, you know, like street signs and like signs yeah. on the buildings. Like like how how have they been misspelled? You like I, you know, I how, think that's how, a like, sign like from the original of using AI. Well maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe. Um and then just like things just not working properly, apparently like, you know, misshapen um face animations and stuff like that have kind of been like touched up and fixed and stuff like that. But the main one is the rain effects, you know, like everybody was saying how bad that was and how easy it was to fix, you know, with all these people who've just gone out and fixed it themselves. Um, so that seems to be the big one. Um, and like you say, Dan, it was raining on the inside for you. So, that And seems- there are parts of the game, I think particularly in San Andreas, there's areas like where a bridge is missing in, in mm. a part of the map. And there's other other bugs I've seen people on Reddit saying there's part, some parts of the game that you just can't get past. Yeah. You know, like actually game-breaking bugs. Oh, wow. Um, and if you look, I mean, there is actually a change log on Rockstar's website and I'm already getting finger eight from scrolling through it. So it's, uh, oh, wow. you know, it is a long list here. But the thing is, the fact that they managed to get all these patches together in like, you know, a week and a half, two weeks across three games. Like you said, Ravi, it just means, you know, if they'd have delayed it by a week, they could have actually put a bit more effort into yeah, it. But, the fact they could fix but, it that quickly. But maybe means, they wouldn't know, have had so long. many people breathing down their necks then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's added a bit of external pressure, you know? I think as well, it was definitely that we need to get it out for Christmas. You know, that kind of really, we need to hit this market yeah, now, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but even on the first couple of days, I mean, people that bought it on the PC, I think Rockstar's platform went down. So they bought the game and they couldn't play it for a couple of days. Um, it's, it's really interesting <laughs> so, well, yeah. here as well, because they're saying that, um, you know, people that bought it on the Rockstar Player are actually it, yeah. getting offered the classic versions of GTA 3, Vice yeah. City and San Andreas bundled in for free as well yep. so they go look we know this is broken Here, play the originals for free <laughs> and then we'll fix this and yeah it's kind of a little you know they're obviously trying to do some damage limitation here i mean i think it is good that they are patching it but i think once that initial impression has got out there now um you know it's already kind of too late for it really, hard to shake it? off um, isn't it yeah but actually kind of on that topic i mean you mentioned about the um the fan community there's one little um video that i'll link up 
in our show notes as well. And I spotted this on Reddit. And this is um, a guy who's just a fan of the game. And he's actually recreated a part of San Andreas using the Far Cry 5 Dunia engine. And this thing looks like what I would have wanted Rockstar to release. If you watch how incredible this looks, there is um, it's a guy called Ghost in Hell who's made it. And there is actually a couple of YouTube videos now um, of people playing this as well. And the graphics, I mean, the lighting, it actually looks like a next generation remake of san andreas all they needed to do was just get a load of fans and modders together and go right yeah. we're gonna pay you and then they would have had something yeah it just it just seems weird that they just didn't you know do like what they did with the crash bandicoot remaster and stuff like that where they literally just built it again from the ground up and made it a full release i mean it is a full release but you know what i mean like actually make a triple a game like I, I can't imagine you know, there's a lot of assets there in the GT for GTA Five. Why didn't they just build it in the you know build the trilogy in the GTA Five engine? Yep. Do you know what I mean? They could have done that and spent more time on it. It's just a cash grab. That's just, Red it Dead just feels Redemption like Two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, they could have just done that. They, they you know and put the assets in there. But yeah, this this uh, this one that you've just pointed out, Dan. Yeah, that's like what should have been really yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of people are making the point in the reddit thread they're like you know there's a quote here it said it's a big shame that rockstar don't realize that grand theft auto has got one of the most brilliant modern communities you know mm. people have loved this game for over 20 years yet they don't want to work alongside them or yeah look at sonic mania you know you i was got, yeah. you yeah. beat me to it i was literally about to say say the same yeah i should have done that but I think the timing for this uh, recreation in the uh, the Far Cry 5 engine is probably very bad. I wouldn't expect that to be online for very long. No. They've got this commercial product out <laughs> It's probably going to be pulled by the time we put yeah. the episode out on Friday. Yeah. If not, we jinx it. We normally do, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we do. So, um, I will link it up, get it while it's hot. And uh, yeah, I hope you mean, I mean, I hope that patch comes to the Switch version. Like I said, I've only played a few hours of it, but already um, I've definitely seen some problems with it. So um, it would be nice if they can finally get a nice finished product out there, I think. So we'll keep an eye on that now video game movies have always been a little bit hit on me so you've actually been to the cinema to see a video game movie over the weekend Joe. yeah i saw resident evil uh, a couple of days ago i saw it on monday night mm. with my buddy john yeah video game movies that's all i would say <laughs> i saw you know, Dune. Good then. that was good you know you see you see i don't want to i could sp- talk about it for the next hour because you know i'm a massive massive resident evil fan um and i and i came out of it I was entertained, like, coming out of it. Like, I was like, I enjoyed that for the last hour and a half. I had fun with it. You know, and on a personal on a personal level, I enjoyed the game, uh, enjoyed the film. But if, like, say I made you go watch it, Dan, and, you know, I'm not too sure your knowledge, Ravi, of Resident Evil games, but you'd just be like, what is going on? <laughs> like, right, okay. You'd just be like, you know, and in terms of... It didn't feel like a zombie film. It felt like a horror film, if that makes sense. Isn't it set back in the 90s? It's set in the 90s, and it's got a fantastic right. soundtrack, which mm. I feel like was actually wasted in some parts and they based it on the first two games happening at the same time which you know i can kind of see what they were trying to do like you know trying to put you know the game to script essentially um it's in the spencer mansion yeah yeah so it's in the spencer yeah. mansion and it's in raccoon city and i, I don't want to spoil it but and i see the best in things you know I'm, i i try to be quite an optimistic positive guy so me and my mate we came out of it and we enjoyed it but we were both like that was a mess. Like that was really like a miss, a mess, and it was silly, but we enjoyed it. Like so, you know, that's all I would say about it without spoiling it. But that's does segue. We're very good at segues today. Um, to our next piece of news, which is apparently there is a uh, Mega Man a live action movie headed to Netflix, right. which has been kind of not announced but kind of leaked, kind of not leaked this week, uh, which is really interesting. Like really interesting. So apparently, um. This has been in development for the last three years. Um, and at this point, we've just it's just been written. You know, nothing's been filmed or anything like that. And it's just some concept art knocking about and stuff. But it's being developed by a company called Churning Entertainment, who I've never heard of. And it's going to be going directly to Netflix, which isn't a bad thing because Netflix are putting out some really good stuff. And we're expecting to see it in 2023, apparently. Because like I say, they haven't started filming it or anything like that yet. I don't know how that's going to work because it's, 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 you know, I don't know if this is official concept art, but, you know, in the concept art, it looks like a real gritty, like, you know, yeah, it's Mega Man, like quite a serious film. Whereas I like f- a live action version. Like a RoboCop yeah, it's a live action style film. thing. Yeah, yeah, RoboCop style. That's perfect, Ravi. Um, personally, I feel like they should have probably gone down the Sonic route and made it like a little bit more kid friendly because it's the blue bomber. It's Mega Man, you know, he's like... 
not that Mega Man is a kid's game because Mega Man's a really tough game. You know, they're really, really hard games. But just the kind of like the aesthetic and the look of them and stuff is very, I wouldn't call it kiddie, but it's very, it is kid friendly. It's very colourful. It's very, the kind of like what happens in the games and stuff like and the that. the roundness of it. and the kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it just looks like they're trying to go down the whole route of what they did with Bomberman, you know, in like 2006 and the Xbox 360 when they did that dreadful gritty version of Bomberman where it was like set in the future and it was like the apocalypse. And it looks like they're going down that route. Now, apparently the, the, the company behind it are behind the film Project Power, which is on Netflix, which I've not seen, but I've heard is all right. And then the guy who's wrote it did write the new Batman film that's coming out next year, or uh, he, he wrote the script to it. Apparently, he's not being credited for it. There's some issue there. So they've made films before, and they've wrote big films before. For somebody to be trusted to write a Batman script, they must be half decent to then, you know, go write a Mega Man script. But I don't know. You know, Resident Evil's Capcom wasn't massively impressed with it. Enjoyed it, but you know, as a general film goer, I don't think people will, people will just be like, what, "What was that?" kind of thing. And I just feel like. It's probably going to the same thing might happen with Mega Man. You know, I just look back on this now. I thought I got a sense of deja vu there. Yeah. We talked about this before and it was announced back in 2018. Yeah. And I think we covered it on the show when it was initially announced back then. So it's took a few years to, um, oh, really? to make it oh, into production maybe then. Yeah. We have spoke about it before then. But yeah, it's it's on there. It's on. So it's Netflix haven't announced it. It's on Chern, Ch- Chernin's Entertainment's website. They've announced it in their bio page. It's like, you know, like, you know, they're about us section, like, you know, this is the films we've worked on. It's like, including Capcom's Mega Man, you know, <laughs> which is going directly to Netflix. So maybe we'll get like a proper announcement or teaser trailer from Netflix at some point where we'll get deja vu and talk about it again. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm much more into Resident Evil than I am Mega Man. And I didn't have massively high hopes for Resident Evil, you know, just because video game films. Um, but we'll see what happens with Mega Man. It'll be interesting. Yeah, like you said, quite an interesting franchise to pick. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that you know kind of translates yeah. to live action as well. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Like Ravi said, it should be that. It should be that roundness, that that blue bomber. It should be yeah. you know, a bit more cartoony. Not, but yeah, it shouldn't live be a, action, yeah. a gritty cyborg <laughs> futuristic film. We'll see. Well, I will admit, before we started recording this week's episode, we're all um, a bit distracted, weren't we, playing around with uh, this next story yeah. that was sent to us on uh, Discord by uh, Matt Godbolt on our Discord server. And this is a virtual BBC micro simulator that you can play in a web browser. And I think this has been uh, made to celebrate the BBC Micro's 40th anniversary that, of course, was um, at the start of this month. And... Uh, even for like you, Joe, who, you know, you weren't a user of the original BBC Micro back in the day, but you were all, you had a bit of fun playing around with this earlier, I think. I did. Yeah, I enjoyed this. I was, straight away, I went on it. I was like, oh, okay, what's this? Like, Dan's added it in. And I was like, oh, the clickiness. <laughs> like, the clickiness of the keyboard is yeah, awesome. Yeah, even the sound of the, the keys. The sound of the yeah. keys, yeah. It's translated. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it's transitioned very well. I'm definitely not good at the uh, BBC Micro. <laughs> I was trying to play Chucky Egg and uh, couldn't figure out how to move left or right, but figured out how to jump. And you guys were listening to me play it and you're going, press, press Z, press X and press the arrows. <laughs> and I just couldn't move. So I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I really, I want to get my hands on it a little bit more. I, I was well and truly impressed with it. It screamed school to me. As, oh, as, really? as soon yeah. as I've seen it, it's just like school. Yes. And it's oh, it's just got that vibe. It's a really complete emulator as well. Like um, it's presented in this wonderful kind of 3D spin stuff. But um, zooming in on the case, you can even see the kind of texture on the surface of it. You know, uh, it's not smooth plastic. It's it's done to that that level of detail and love. And I was looking at some of the stuff. So you've got like loading functions for standard games. You've got a huge game archive on there, but you can also load local files or, you know, zip files onto there. Pretty much run anything in this kind of a uh, virtual BBC, which is just amazing. Like I'm sure you, they, they were your primary system at school, uh, Dan. Oh yeah. Even looking at it. Cause I mean, on this, um, this website here, it gives you like a, a 3d model of it. And you can use just by clicking and actually drag around and look behind. It's got like the the cub monitor. The yeah, oh, that's Microsoft so school, cool, isn't it? Like, yeah. <laughs> so you can look underneath it as well. It's like it's really cool. But um, yeah, it's actually based on it's it's a JavaScript emulator, JS Beeb. Matt Godbolt actually programmed that with um, 
Paul, Malin, um, a few other guys as well. So it's a really complete emulator there. Um, and you can, you know, pick hundreds of games on here. You can load your own games in as well. And it, what I love as well is the sound effects and stuff like you mentioned. It kind of does give you that. So when you load a game in, you can hear the floppy disk drive whirring away and the click of the keyboard as well. So it kind of gives you that the sights and sounds of the original machine that I think was yeah. a big part and of the it, experience. It feels like VR as well. It feels like this would be really good in VR. And uh, we've covered like VR C64 and stuff like this. And this seems like it could translate really well, just being in that space with your BBC. But of course it needs to be in the classroom. Yeah. Well, I mean, what they're saying, if you look at the um, the about section of this, they're saying it's the first BBC emulator for the metaverse. So, you know, they're, they're on trend with it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, very cool. And I love the fact that, you know, it's all accessible from the web browser as well. So perfect if you're uh, maybe in work over Christmas and you want to kill a bit of time. You know, we need, it, we like, need a bit more love for the BBC on this podcast. I think we need to focus on some BBC episodes and stuff because, man, just playing with this, I miss that system so much. And I, I've, I've ignored the BBC over time. Yeah, when the um, it celebrated its 40th anniversary, actually, I shared the, you know, the Steve Ferber episode that we did. Yeah, that um, was fabulous. On Twitter, so. Yeah, yeah. Read re- if you want to check out some uh, BBC micro history. If you, you know, still feeling a nostalgic for it, being that it is forty years old this month, and um, definitely worth checking back into our archives. And if you want to waste a bit of time messing around with the virtual BBC micro, I'll link that up in our show notes as well. Now, lots more stories to get through the portable Sega Saturn. We need to talk about that in a minute. Atari, who've acquired a website that we use pretty much every week when we're putting together this show. We'll talk more about that in a sec. But before we do, let's give a big thank you to one of our most loyal supporters who've supported the Retro Out podcast for many years. That is our friends at Future Publishing. Of course, the publishers of the amazing Retro Gamer magazine. Now, we've got an amazing offer that you definitely need to take advantage of right now. You can get three issues of your favourite gaming magazine from Future Publishing, including Retro Gamer, PC Gamer UK, Play and Edge, for just £3, $3, or three euros, depending on where you are in the world. So that means you get up to 86% off the price. And this offer is exclusively for listeners of the Retro Hour podcast, and it is available worldwide. Last week, we had a few people get in touch going, I don't live in the UK. Can I take advantage of this? You can. It's either just three pounds, three dollars or three euros. And there are so many incredible things in Futures Gaming magazines. I know you've got the current issue of Edge magazine, on your desk in front of yeah, you. Yeah, right so right? a lot of people don't know, but I actually do the deals on this podcast as well. So I've been subscribed yeah. to Edge since Future started kind of sponsoring us. So I've got a huge collection of Edge. And uh, this is just a great magazine because we do retro stuff. But, you know, I like to keep an eye on the future of interactive entertainment. And uh, they've got a feature on Sifu. Um, Stephen Poole is uh, writing, uh, who wrote the book Trigger Happy. He always does an article in there and... Uh, there's some great quotes in there. He says, uh, there's a reason why people who wear Google's short-lived AR spectacles rapidly became known as glass holes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's also uh, a look at the 20th anniversary of the Xbox as well and the kind of history of that. So just, you know, the quality of the writers in some of the magazines are actually fantastic. And now I've got this nice little collection of Edge magazines as well. And I've been reading um, Play Magazine, you know, when I was away in my cottage over the weekend. I picked up a copy of Play before I went. Obviously, it covers PlayStation 5, PS4, PSVR. They also do retro stuff in here as well. There's quite a big retro PlayStation section in here, um, including going into the history of Grand Theft Auto 3, looking back on that game 20 years on. There's a Christmas gift guide in there as well on, you know, powering up your PS5 from SSDs to headsets as well. So lots of stuff in there for your PlayStation fan. Retro Gamer this month as well. There's a really good article in there, 50 Things That Change gaming forever celebrating the games the systems the publishers have defined our hobby 20 years of halo combat evolved in there as well and the evolution of load runner the history of rares there's also um, a little feature about the atari jaguar pro controllers so if you like our podcast you should be reading retro gamer every month and pc gamer they kind of go into um riot games this month as well so whatever your interest if it's the classic stuff obviously that we cover on our podcast you want to know about modern gaming as well plenty of big hitters to choose from this month as well and you can get your first three issues of any of futures gaming magazines for either three pounds three dollars or three euros all you have to do is use our exclusive link magazinesdirect.com slash retro trial and i will say one thing take advantage of this right now how many times do we do this and people get in touch like two months down the line and goes that that offer's still on 
it happens a lot. I've even done it myself. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad Ravi said that uh, <laughs> that he uh, he subscribed because I tried to do it a while back to get you know one one of these and uh, it had actually run out. So right. I I've learned the hard way. So do it. You know if, if this sounds up your street, you know free issues for three pound. Do it now before before the offer is gone. Yeah, so do it right now on this website, magazinesdirect.com slash retro trial. And of course, you'll be really helping out this podcast by showing our sponsors a bit of love and get that incredible deal. And a big thank you to our friends at Future Publishing for their support of our show. I think it's fair to say we all love the Sega Saturn. You know, definitely one of my favourite systems to bust out every now and then. Great hardware in there as well, you know, a bit of a bit of a powerhouse back in its day. Never anything I thought would make it into a portable handheld system but there is an article here um, the title of it is mad lad cuts <laughs> motherboard in half to create a portable sega saturn and it works i i love that it's like you know this is not for the faint of hearted because somebody no. is cutting <laughs> cutting the motherboard of a sega saturn in half and you know the sega saturn is expensive now you know i i, I mean this this is a i believe a japanese guy it might be chinese actually uh, guy who's doing this um his his username is t z m w x and mm. then his youtube channel where he's actually put the videos up is china t z m w x so i assume yes chinese and like i say not for the faint of heart it's the first thing he does in the videos is cut the motherboard in half um but this looks fantastic now unfortunately the videos is just music playing over them and then there is subtitles which are in chinese so mm. He doesn't really talk you through what he's doing, but you get a visual of what's kind of happening. And it looks like he was working on this since the start of 2019. He was working on it for a long, long time. And what I really love about it is, you know, it, it's about the, si- the the kind of finished project. is about the size of a Game Gear. And yet, absolutely awesome that he's got the Sega Saturn running on a handheld. Um, but what I love about it is how much original tech is in there. And that he's actually got the original controller in there as well. He's he cuts the controller in half, and actually has the controller buttons and everything fit. Oh wow! Fit into a, a 3D printed shell, you know, like for the, the handheld, which is absolutely fantastic. And obviously, the Sega Saturn controller is kind of like legendary for being like such a good controller, like perfect for those like 2D games and set. That Saturn did so well, like two D fighters and stuff. Mm. So it's absolutely amazing that he's actually got the original hardware in there as well. Um, you know, the original controller. What's interesting about it though is, as he's making it, he does have the motherboard hooked up to a exposed disk drive, and the disk is spinning, playing the game on kind of like the early stages of the handheld. You know, before it's put together, it's got like a tiny little three inch screen you know, separated over here, you know, on cables. And then you've got the controller kind of like built into the prototype and everything. But in the finished product, there isn't a disk drive. I believe it is, it's an SD card the games are running yeah, on. Yeah, it's, it's like an SD mm. card loader. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's still Saturn hardware. Well, you well, know. you could kind of let him off for not having the yeah. CD drive in there. That would just make it massively chunky. But also, did you know, Joe, that he's got the memory card in there? Oh, wow. I didn't see that part. <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> mental. So he's actually got, you know, the memory card for the, the memory unit. The um, Yeah, it mech- came in yeah. those separate carts as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you plug into the back of the Saturn, then, which we all thought was a Mega Drive port when we were children. Yeah, uh, so he's a- <laughs> he, he can actually do saves on it as well. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's like, um, you know, before we saw that people were cutting up the Wii's and that they were making them a lot smaller to fit in these portable systems, but they were using a lot of like third party designed boards. Well, there's not Mm. been anything like power units or anything that's been third party designed for this. He's just created it himself from scratch and kind of soldered it all together, which is just absolutely nuts. Like, no wonder it took him so long to get it done <laughs> and to have features like the, the the memory card in there, which he's got accessible um, in the back. Oh, sorry. I was playing the video. Um, <laughs> it have the memory card in there, which he's got accessible in the back. And then he can actually take the chip out and place it into a little memory card reader and then read it on a real Saturn as well. So, um, you know, it's got that option to use your saves 
as well on an external Saturn. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I'm watching that start of the video where we cut some other board in half. It <laughs> kind of makes my me my palms a bit sweaty because there's no going back when you've done that. No, exactly. And it is literally the first thing in the video as well. Like, but you know, the, the article kind of explains it. But I think you've got to watch it, you know, to see yeah. how cool it looks with him putting the controller in there. You know, I didn't even realize he had the uh, the expansion pack thing in there as well. So, yeah, also, really, really cool. Like the enclosure looks really nicely done. I know it's kind yeah. of a simple 3D printed device and stuff, but um, it fits it really well, doesn't it? It, and it looks yeah. like it could be official Sega Tech. Like it's got the it's it, it doesn't look a million miles away from the Game Gear because he does a comparison. You know, it, it does look you know more like the Nomad. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. It's got the that. logo as well. Sega Saturn yeah. logo is printed in, in the bottom of it. Yeah, too. it looks really nice. You know, kind of looks like he's etched it in though, like Sega Saturn with a knife. <laughs> but, um, it is, it is really impressive, and uh, shoulder buttons and all sorts in there. Yeah, this is great. And he's actually made the schematics and the uh, cutting list if you dare do it yourself available online. Go on, Ravi. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No. <laughs> I mean, ne- next, he needs to get the VCD unit in there. And it'll be rocking. Yeah, of all the mods we've talked about on the show over the years, I think this is definitely one of the most impressive kind of homemade ones. So, um, yeah, kudos to him. Very, very cool. Um, the fact that it took him three years, I, I don't imagine there's going to be a... He's not going to put these up for sale on a website, I wouldn't imagine. There'll be quite a, a backlog of pre-orders, I imagine. But, yeah, really cool. If you want to make your own, the schematics are all up there as well. So we'll link that up in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat with Jan Beta, coming up very soon, keeping those retro systems alive, this is quite a surprise headline. And um, this was actually rumoured for a couple of weeks. Now it turns out it's, uh, it's happened. This is Atari, the new Atari, who bought the website Moby Games for £1.1 million. Pounds. I don't, don't wreck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't wreck it. It's, yeah, exactly. That's the first thing. But um, I don't get the angle of it because obviously Moby Games is like a... It's user base, isn't it? Like, you know, it's like fan based, and they've got like three hundred thousand like games uploaded on there, and and we use Moby Games quite yeah. a lot, don't we? For like it, our research and our developers and stuff. Like Ravi, you're always on it, aren't you? I I love it. Yeah, it's a games yeah. listing service, basically. Yeah, and you yeah. know, it will it will have details about the games. It will have like trivia facts and stuff. And you know what my thinking of this is? They've invested in Antstream as well. Yeah. They've also got the VCS and this this kind of stuff. If they would funnel that database into an online service, then they can offer like additional stuff like details of, you know, the developers that were on that game, extra facts and stuff like that that could pop up. So my hope is that they use they use Moby Games as kind of the database, the idea behind it to work with Antstream or to work with their streaming service or or whatever they're going to do to add additional information and stuff. I just hope they don't like add a paywall in there or turn it into something, you know, bad or try and update it because Moby games, it's a really simple site. It works well. It's not broken. It just works. And that's the greatest thing about it. And it's barely changed since 1999 when it started really in terms of, you know, it's like 1.1 million is a bargain for it. I I was going to say that I feel like that's really underpriced. You know, I feel mm. like they have got that for an absolute steal, but maybe it's just not as popular as I think, you know, just because we're so prominent with us doing the podcast every week and stuff, you know, we use it, the three of us use it so much. So, you know, maybe it's not quite as popular uh, as I think, you know, with it being sold for $1.5 million, but yeah, yeah. what is, yeah, maybe you're right about Atari. Like that's probably, I can't even think of an angle they're going for. So I would, if I had to put money on it, I'd go with what you've just said, Ravi, you know, maybe they're going to, incorporate it into something with the vcs or yeah because they have invested in antstream as well yeah this week so you know that 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 shows that they're kind of shooting for that streaming delivery kind of area so long as they don't make it an exclusive on the atari vcs can you imagine that'd be what you can only use moby games if you (laughs) buy a vcs (laughs) well you've got one done so we'll be all right yeah i'll be all right yeah this year i'll be fine so uh, yeah we'll we'll link that up in our show notes as well now just before before we get into interview with jan beta i just want to give a big shout to um, one of our listeners nivrig who uh, sent us this on discord he's actually made a christmas game and I was thinking the other day, because every year, I mean, it's a bit of a tradition of mine, I'll sit down and play Holiday Lemmings, normally on Christmas Eve. You know, I do like a bit of a cheesy Christmas game. This one looks a load of fun as well. It's a downloadable Amiga game where you can name your own price called that Turbo Santa. Yeah, it's, it's Nivrig's a great little developer. He's done a Dodgy Rocks before, which was a really yeah. good 
game. We met, we we met him, in met Ireland, him in Amiga we? Island, yeah. And uh, Turbo Tomato as well, which is quite a good game for the Amiga, actually. You know, you get a lot of releases and uh, they're not that fast or sometimes they're built on a language where it's not that good. Well, this is all like 100% assembly programmed. And um, mm. like he's got the soundtrack uh, from uh, TDK as well, Mark Knight. So there's some decent oh, nice. music on there. And this one, Looks like it's kind of a, a Christmas update on Turbo Tomato. And, uh, you know, it runs on a classic Amiga, one megabyte of RAM. And, uh, you know, where this game kind of really shines has been the high score competition. So lots of people have been doing high score competitions online. And I kind of like the idea that it's name at any price as well. And I think they've kind of changed the idea of tomatoes to mm. Santa running around having to collect his presence in a kind of chaotic environment yeah and actually it's um there's a there's a high score competition that's running until christmas eve oh we can get involved in that as well so um it's available now so definitely worth a download if you want to uh, feel festive now of course uh, this is actually our final normal episode of this podcast for 2021 which is just insane what a ride the last 12 months has been and actually we're going to be looking back and picking out our favorite moments of uh, all the interviews that we've done this year in our best of episode that's going to drop on christmas eve so only a couple of weeks away now before then though we've got the big one that we're doing this weekend the retro hour annual christmas super quiz is coming oh up oh my god feeling confident no. boys <laughs> well actually i've got joe the winner on my side <laughs> yeah. so i'm gonna do all I'm, right we've got we've got this ravi i'm feeling confident i'm am i two years in a row of winning yeah so you know I, I've, I've got to go for the third year but um yeah competition's going to be hard um rmc i think i beat him by like what two points maybe last year it was very tight it very was very tight. very very tight so you know and not only we've got rmc we've got mark fixes stuff helping him out and then we've got ollie and paul coming back as well who you know have crushed me and ravi in the past so <laughs> you know i've got my winning streak which makes me feel confident but then also the competition as well so dan you're playing it safe being the quiz master again um well I, i've had to take three days off work to write these questions three days I, I tell you <laughs> ollie scares me when he says that he's rehearsing and doing quizzes and practicing <laughs> yeah which he has been doing for about two weeks now i believe so uh, your boy's gonna get your butts in gear um so the christmas quiz is coming up of course our patrons are gonna get that first because we're doing it on sunday so it should be out to them at least for you know next day or two afterwards um so they'll be the first people to hear it and play along as well and uh, we're gonna try and do a video version of it for our patrons as well just one of the rewards you get for being a supporter of the retro hour because you know like i said at the end of this year um seriously our patrons you just made it so much easier for us to keep doing this show throughout 2021 we say it every week and you know sometimes i feel like oh god we're, we're begging it and stuff like that but honestly this time a year and a half ago we really did think it was the end of the retro hour um, mm. So it's been absolutely amazing to just carry on doing it and just have all that support, you know, on Patreon and stuff like that as well. So it's massively, massively appreciated. Yeah. And the fact that we're coming into January, which is going to be our sixth birthday of this show coming Mental. up next month, which is nuts. And that doesn't mean all our bills are coming out as well, although, you know, the hosting renewal and everything like that, the website costs and audio hosting. So actually now will be a very good time if you want to help out this show to back us on Patreon. Not only will you get the um, the quiz episode early and you normally get the show early and ad free every single week you also get extra patrons only content we do an extra 10 15 minutes sometimes just for our patrons you also get access to the retro hour after hours podcast if you're a gold member or above which is our exclusive monthly podcast that we do just for patron members we're going to be recording one of those as well next week so it's going to be a bit of a christmasy episode of that and then we're going to be doing our retro hour christmas party which is our patrons hangout a christmas themed one that's coming up in a couple of weeks time i've got a feeling this one's going to be such well a you know you said that jumpers were compulsory i was running around sweating today like oh what, what am i gonna get what am i gonna have to wear so i'm gonna see what i come up with for a, a christmas jumper for the christmas party you've got to look bad for the work staff do haven't you really the cheesier the better and i know a lot of people aren't having christmas parties this year so this is a good excuse to so come and join ours and um, we're doing it in a couple of weeks time on uh, i believe the day is yet yeah, sunday the uh, sunday the 19th of december at 8 p.m. UK time. So all patrons are welcome to that. If you'd like to come along, you'll find the link in our Patreon. And of course, you get a big thank you on the show in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And thank you so much for your support this week to our latest patrons, Nathan Tabor, Tim Robinson, Laura Linneman, and Hugo's Desk, who all backed us on Patreon. We hugely appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join them, you'll find it right now on our website at theretrohour.com. 
Now, before we get into our chat with this week's special guest, Jan Bater, who is coming up in just a moment, let's give a big thank you to another huge supporter of the Retro Hour podcast, and that is our friends at ExpressVPN, who've been a big supporter all throughout 2021. And actually, what about this for an analogy? Going online without using ExpressVPN is kind of like using your smartphone without a protective case. Most of the time, you might be all right, but all it takes is one drop onto solid concrete, and you'll wish you protected yourself, as I did once, actually, before we... Recorded an episode, I remember dropping my iPhone in the car park at work. Ouch, yeah. It was a bit devastating. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> but you've always been, I mean, ever since I've known you, Ravi, you've been a massive advocate for privacy and VPNs as well. And I know ExpressVPN is the one that you use and trust. Yeah, totally. Like, the thing that really gets you is unencrypted networks. So if you're, like, in hotels or airports or cafes, anywhere, really, uh, where you connect to an unencrypted network, you don't know if that network's genuine. You don't know if someone set that up to kind of do a man in the middle attack and end up stealing your personal information and data and whatever you have on your PC, really, passwords and stuff like that. Well, Express is really easy to set up. You know, you just, I've even set it up so when I turn my PC on, it automatically connects and opens Express VPN straight away. It's really fast. And then it means that, you know, you've got encryption on your device and uh, it, enables you and uh, it stops those people kind of being able to access stuff, especially if you're on a, an encrypted network. Yeah, because, I mean, there are YouTube videos that show, you know, how easy it is to do those man-in-the-middle Yeah, with really simple and, uh, devices as well. Like, yeah. you know, yeah, it's incredibly easy, as you'll probably know if you're in the uh, uh, info tech kind of world. But using ExpressVPN, I mean, it is that secure, the, say here, and it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past their encryption. Dead easy to use. Fire up the app, one button, click it, you're protected. Works on all your devices, your phones, your laptops, tablets, much more as well. You can stay secure on the go. So we want you to try out ExpressVPN for yourself and get three months completely free on a one-year plan. So you can secure your data today by visiting our exclusive link and, of course, support the podcast by doing it, ExpressVPN com slash retro that is expressvpn.com slash retro get that three months extra free and support our podcast and a massive thank you to our mates at expressvpn right next talking about keeping those retro systems alive things to look out for maintaining your retro computer and console collection with our special guest jan beta next on the retro hour podcast <laughs> You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for our favourite bit of the show, where we welcome on our special guest. And I've got to say, our guest this week has really helped me out with a few uh, retro restoration projects recently with his fantastic YouTube channel. Let's welcome on our guest this week, the wonderful Jan Beta. How are you doing, Jan? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Very good, thank you, and really appreciate you coming on the podcast this week. Um, we've got lots of stuff to talk about. I know your channel is uh, definitely one of the uh, the leading channels for uh, repairing old machines and keeping them going. So, hopefully, you can give us some uh, some advice on that in the uh, over the next hour or so as well. But it's always nice to kind of go back and find out our guests' history with computers. I mean, do you remember what first got you into computing? Then, when did you first get your hands on one? Um, my father was the big nerd in the family and had, I think, the first one he brought home was, was a TI-99-4A in 1984 or something. And that was basically the first computer I ever saw as a child. And uh, very soon after he brought that home, he realized that it was no longer uh, like was no longer maintained and was taken off the market because uh, Jack Trammell, a certain Jack Trammell did some uh, trickery to remove Texas Instruments home computer line from the market, basically, and uh, brought the Commodore 64 into the spotlight. And my father bought one of those. <laughs> and yeah, that was the first real computer that I ever got in touch with and started playing games on and even started programming in basic and things like that and figuring things out. Were, were there much like Texas Instruments stuff then before uh, around in Germany? It was it was relatively popular, I think, because um, basically it was really cheap to buy those at one certain point when Com there was like a price war between Commodore and Texas Instruments and uh, the TIs got really cheap at some point and a lot of people bought them, I think, at least in Germany. They were like, there were piles and piles in, in supermarkets and uh, they were selling them everywhere, basically. 
it's really easy to get them. As you mentioned, um, Commodore, you know, that, that there was a lot of presence in Germany. And I was just wondering, like, what systems you had, like, growing up then and uh, uh, what kind of systems your peers had. It was very much uh, the Commodore 64 was the most popular computer everywhere when I grew up. Yeah, most of my most of my friends had Commodore 64s at the time. I, I got my first own Commodore 64 in 1987. And uh, soon afterwards, a lot of my friends got the same machine. One of my friends had a Commodore 128, <laughs> but that was only used in 64 mode, basically. And yeah, I knew somebody had a CPC, Schneider in Germany, Amstrad mm. in the UK. <laughs> A CPC four six four, but that wasn't that wasn't really popular. And the uh, spectrums and things like that. Basically, I, I d didn't know anybody who had one at the time in Germany, although they were really popular over there where you are. <laughs> yeah, and I know there was, um, you know, particularly in Russia and Poland, I think as well. It was quite, you know, big. Um, I think it was clones mainly of the the Sinclair machines back yeah, I then. Think I in, mean, in the east it was clones, and but, yeah. but the the Sinclair machines were really popular in Spain, I think, and in France. I mean, did you notice that after the war came down, that kind of unification of like the computer scenes? And how did that kind of work? So I imagine the east and the west probably had quite different machines. Oh yes, that was pretty interesting. But you didn't get to see many of the uh, eastern machines because they were so. Uh, uh, I don't want to say inferior, but they were really. Um, mm. there, there are some some like GDR made computers, but they were like uh, ten years behind uh, technology wise. I think from the stuff that was uh, made in the West, and uh, many people in the GDR actually um, imported Commodore sixty fours and things like that, and even Amigas <laughs> at the time. But they were like they were um, really expensive to buy them in the eastern part but still a lot of people got them because they were so much better than the original eastern german computers well i know one machine that um i i had as a kid that wasn't popular in the usa but you know had quite a bit of popularity certainly for a couple of years in europe i think because we were selling them off cheap was the commodore 16 and the plus four i mean i know you had the the commodore 116 in germany as well i mean wasn't much of a a scene around like the the commodore 264 range I, uh, yeah, I knew some people who had them, people who used them for business stuff, I think, even. The the mm. Plus 4, especially, was like sold. It was marketed as a business machine for the small business, and uh, some people fell for that, I think. <laughs> 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 the business part of it wasn't really good <laughs> at, in any way. But uh, yeah, the, the C16, I, there was quite a scene, but I didn't really, uh, I, I didn't really know anybody who, who had a C16 at the time. And I kind of uh, knew that it wasn't compatible with the Commodore 64 and that got me, uh, I, I wasn't interested in that. <laughs> a lot of us here didn't find that out until after we bought it. Yeah, that was kind of, that was <laughs> kind of a lot of people were tricked by um, yeah. <laughs> thinking it was like, like a successor to the C64. And uh, so, yeah, so, so they also got conned like Dan did when he was younger. <laughs> my, my parents, yeah. <laughs> but it's well, not a bad system. I, I think I, nowadays, now that I, I have... Uh, I think I have all of the range now, the plus four, the uh, 160 and the 16. They are quite neat little systems. I like them a lot. Actually. There's a good demo scene around them as well. Yeah, these days. There's, 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 there's a huge demo scene in, in Hungary. And I think some of the some of the Eastern countries, they were really popular over there and still are. Well, talking about the demo scene, did you see much of it when you were younger? And were there people, you know, passing around demos and stuff and... Uh, you just get into, did you attend any demo parties or know any people that did? I was, I mean, I was like uh, nine, 10 years old and I wasn't really much. Yeah, it was of, more, I was more, more bigger boys. In in our, yeah. yeah, I was, <laughs> I was more interested in, in games and such. And there were some demos that were uh, copied and we like marveled at and, and, uh, listen listen to the music especially i remember making uh taping the music from the from the uh, commodore 64 and some sit tunes and i had like cassettes with uh sit tunes on them and things like that but yeah apart from that not much not much demo scene crack trolls and things like that but <laughs> <laughs> well when did you start to tinker around with electronics and were there any things, because I mean, I, I've never been great at electronics, but I remember taking apart like the, the video recorder to see how it worked and I couldn't put it back together again. I mean, were there any things that you broke when you were a kid? 
Oh yeah, a lot of things. I think um, as a kid, I, I was uh, basically I was taking things apart, and and yeah, as you said, um, to take it apart and couldn't uh, put it back together. Basically, that happened a lot. But I was really interested in electronics. I didn't learn anything about it and didn't know how to hold a soldering iron or things like that until very much later when I uh, I learned uh, to I actually studied uh, audio engineering audio stuff yeah cool and yeah that's when i when i learned when i repaired my first uh, amplifiers and uh, solar cables and things like that and i got into electronics from that point on but mostly self-taught i'm still learning <laughs> every time i repair something <laughs> well, which um magazines were popular when you were growing up then did you buy any computer magazines regularly oh yeah there were quite a few in germany there's um one popular one for a number of systems was a uh, happy computer <laughs> and uh, one specifically for the Commodore 64 that I read a lot was a uh, 64er like 64er <laughs> right that's that's really that's really well known i think uh yeah maybe you've heard of it or seen it i don't know yeah i've seen it online yeah archives yeah, and stuff that's that's that was the most popular one for the Commodore 64 and then later the the same uh publishers made the amiga magazine just just titled Amiga. That was really popular as well. There was uh, Power Play, which was a games magazine, really popular as well. There were like right. the... Um, I, I remember we had some of the UK magazines here that had more... I think the German magazines rarely had cover discs until right. much later, I think. I remember those from the PC times when you had like CDs and things. But um, there were some disc magazines that were specifically disc based where you had just a disc basically and a little leaflet for the commodore 64 like uh, input 64 input uh, 64 was a popular one that had uh, all kinds of software quite quite good software on tape or disc was available on both tape and disc well what did you think of like the trs 80 machines in radio shack because i've seen on your channel that you've you've done a few repairs on that <laughs> uh i, I, I know it's like not I don't know, maybe I'm generalizing, but not many Europeans had the knowledge of them because, uh, you know, they seem like very American systems. Yeah, there were, I think there were very few of them here. I tried, it was actually, I got one to repair it for the Septendi thing we did on YouTube with a couple of YouTubers. And uh, basically in September, we all tried to work on uh, Tandy Radio Shack machines. And I got, I tried to find one on eBay, specifically some Tandy Radio Shack machine of any kind. It was really difficult to find one for a reasonable price. And then I bought a completely broken TRS-80 uh, for like, I think, 250 euros, which is really expensive for like a broken piece of, uh, yeah, it, it didn't look nice either. It was really, it is, it still is broken, by the way. I didn't fix it. <laughs> I didn't manage to fix it yet. But yeah, I didn't know anything about those they were not in, popular at all here. Yeah, they're interesting machines as well, but they're Z80 based, aren't they? Yeah, but yeah, they, so I haven't got it, it was like a, like a, like a really that was a really a real nerd machine. I think there were very few, a select few, couple of people who worked on those and, and used them. I think <laughs> we have so many developers that talk about them, but it's mainly American developers that come on and and talk about using the TRS80 and stuff like that. Seemed like yeah, it was think, a cheaper cheaper version back then. Yeah, I think they were basically the first um, readily available cheap machines that you can pro could program on over there, I guess. As kids who played video games, I don't know if it was the same with your circle of friends. I mean, have you got many uh, memories of, of piracy being quite prevalent back in the day then? Was, <coughs> was copy parties a big thing then? Uh, yeah, uh, mainly. I remember um, we, we had some neighbors and one of my neighbors uh brought home a commodore 64 with uh, like a huge pile of discs we all had uh disc drives i, I know that in in the uk our uh, disc drives weren't really that popular you were more no. tape based in germany everybody had a disc drive everybody i know i knew had a disc drive uh right from the start and uh yeah he came he brought he brought home a uh, commodore 64 from the flea market with uh really many many discs and we copied them all that was the first time i got into contact with pirated software really on, on a larger scale but that was that got uh really popular at school like uh, swapping discs and uh, things like that um 
especially when I got my Amiga. That was it was really popular to copy stuff for the Amiga. Not so much for the C64 in my circles. <laughs> Well, yeah, I do well, remember there were kids at school that had um, Amiga games. You know, they probably didn't play them. They collected them like trading cards. Yeah, just, it, was more, know, yeah. Like it was really more like collecting things and like making nice stickers for the discs and things like that. <laughs> what was it like when the um, Amigas actually came out in Germany then? And like, how, how were they marketed and, and sold to people? Because I know there was a big focus on hardware and like hardware add-ons in the uh, German market. Yeah, there were. I remember the um, the first Amigas, like the Amiga One Thousand. My father was was really keen on those because he was the nerd, <laughs> and he had a sixty four at the time and, and always wanted an Amiga. And the uh, first Amigas were just uh, stupidly expensive, like amazing machines, but nobody could afford them really as a hobbyist. So when the Amiga Five Hundred came out, he instantly bought one <laughs> in nineteen eighty seven. And I remember he brought it home, and I was absolutely. He bought a, a color monitor for it. We didn't have color monitors for the Commodore sixty fours, and I was so blown away by the machine, like by seeing the graphics for the first time. He had uh, like deluxe paint bundled with it and things like that. That was kind of a revelation. That was <laughs> a new thing. And I remember in Germany they had um, the marketing was really very much aimed at the PC compatibility of the Amigas. They had this the sidecar where you could have a PC running on the Amiga. That was a really huge factor for marketing, I think. I like the uh, bridge boards and stuff. Yeah, the like bridge board. That. That's yeah. the, the bridge board is the later incarnation for the Amiga One Thousand. It was the sidecar like uh, thing that you that sat beside the case and you plugged into the, the expansion port on the side. <laughs> just just out of curiosity, I was, I was thinking like, how long did Amiga last in Germany then? But was it like, because it was, it was up to the late 90s, early 2000s with us in the UK. How, how yeah. long did it last in culture there? Yeah, it was pretty clear in 95, 96 that the Amiga was no longer going to prevail for that much longer i think i used my amiga as really used it until like 97 or 98 and then uh yeah i had to make the switch to some boring windows pc <laughs> and i think most people did at that point nobody really believed that uh, amiga would be would be going anywhere at that point sadly very sadly because at that stage i remember the amiga after commodore was bought by a German company, wasn't it? Um, Escom. Which, yeah, it was. Was there no Escom. like kind of? Yeah, was there no kind of like feeling around that that it it might be a a rebirth? Yeah, there was. There was a, very briefly. There was like, uh, it was kind of a relief that it got bought at all, and they were they were like they continued to produce the Amiga twelve hundred and the four thousand, and they even had plans for some new models, but they never really materialized. And it was yeah, it was kind of a shady company I, I remember seeing some interviews with like the manager types from escom and they were all like ah, they came across a bit shady <laughs> mm. at the time and it was pretty clear pretty quickly that they just wanted to um, make as much money as they could from the amiga brand and then just left it to die <laughs> basically and that was what happened in the end well anyone that watches your channel will know that you know you do some um really good advice on you know repairing our systems and maintaining them so it'd be great to get into that a little bit i mean say for example we've got listeners who've maybe got old machines i mean is there anything you you kind of look for you know when, when you first get a new computer like well, a new old computer in is there any kind of things that people should be looking out for to keep these old machines going yeah there are a couple of things that are like universally true i think most power supplies from the 80s and some from the 90s are utterly crap and should be immediately replaced before you even try powering them on. <laughs> and there are like a replacement power supplies for most systems these days. If in doubt, you can always build yourself. Most most voltages you need are standard voltages. So you have like um, pre-made ones that suit the system you want to run. But most of the old ones are really dangerous because they are... Uh, are not really regulated correctly and sometimes uh, spit out too high voltages and damage the systems. 
I know that affects the Commodore 64 particularly. That, yeah, that has a particularly bad power supply that it came with. It's not a bad power supply. I mean, they, they lasted for decades mostly, but uh, nowadays they are like uh, bad, badly designed and old. And uh, yeah, some of them fail in catastrophic, catastrophic ways nowadays and take the machines with them. I think you make a good point, Next, A lot of these machines were only designed to last a couple of years. You know, They didn't think we'd still be using them 30, 40 years on. Yeah. I remember um, Bill Hurd, the designer of the Commodore 128 and the uh, 264 series, he said they designed the machines to last at, at the most for five years or something. And uh, he was really astounded by them like being still operational today because they were not engineered to last that long at all. <laughs> So we've uh, we've got the power supply. What, what else then? Oh, there's uh, the electrolytic capacitors is uh, something I always replace because they are there is there's a few uh, like electronics parts that age by design. Like ele- electrolytic capacitors basically uh, have a liquid or gel in them that slowly evaporates over time, and uh, they dry out and then they don't work anymore. And in the worst case, they just uh, short out and damage things or they leak the electrolyte the gel or the liquid uh, onto the circuit board and uh, that eats the traces those should be replaced after a couple of decades i mean they they are designed for to last a couple of decades i guess but uh, yeah these machines are old so and wasn't there a period when it was like a well-known industry thing that you know bad capacitors were used in a lot of machines. Yeah, a couple, a couple of uh, eras actually. There's the uh, the, the Amiga 1200 and 600. The, there's the early uh, surface mount electrolytic capacitors are basically all crap. <laughs> they leak, and yeah, they w- they were crap from the start. They didn't know how to manufacture them correctly, I guess, at the point and. There's also some of the through-hole components. There's there's some years where those were crap because there was some uh, scandal with uh, the wrong chemical mixture that got stolen from somewhere. I don't remember exactly how this, the story goes, but there's there's like a, a couple of years where all capacitors basically fail. <laughs> Didn't they uh, put some in backwards as well? Um, yeah, Commodore famously yeah. did that. I think in the in the uh, uh, CD32, there's a famous example of, uh, I think, two capacitors put in backwards. <laughs> from <laughs> the factory? Yeah, from factory. And yeah, basically in all CD32s that were ever released, that was at the, towards the end of the production of, of uh, the old Commodore. And uh, they rushed production, I guess. Yeah, and I guess. I guess that's a bad thing having them in backwards then, yeah? Yeah, usually they should just explode but they didn't in most cases because there were so uh, low voltage that there was too low voltage to make them explode <laughs> usually they they are they are like bloating and uh exploding at some point but didn't happen in many cd32s they just worked with the capacitors in backwards <laughs> wow <laughs> so yeah we've got power supply capacitors anything else then on the list that you look at um, yeah, some of the old chips, of course, but the 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 power supply is definitely the most dangerous thing. If you re- re- replace that with a modern one, um, you can just try to power the system on at that point. And then there's there's a million things that can fail, like uh, the chips, the ICs are some of them are really badly made or badly manufactured and basically eat themselves from the inside over time and fail. Yeah, Every, basically everything can fail, and and just cleaning the heads of stuff like uh, the floppy drive oh, yeah. and uh, yeah the, the the cassette readers and stuff. Yeah, lubrication is also an issue with the. I had so many like disk drives where they they were actually functioning correctly, but they weren't lubricated enough for the head to move fast enough. So you you just add a, dr- a drop of oil and they start working again <laughs> for many disk drives. There's one thing as well that I've noticed on a lot of my floppy disk-based systems. Um, I was actually using an Amiga 500 today to make a video, and there was a disk loading in it, but it kept thinking the disk had been ejected even though it was still in the drive. I mean, is that a common fault as well with these old disk drives? Yes. Uh, I've had that is there a couple any way to of fix times. It? Yeah, there's, there's like a, some of them um, are detecting if a disk is inserted with a, with a little light sensor, and some of the older ones have an actual physical switch in there. There's like a little uh, 
a switch that actuates when you insert a disk and then uh, pops into one of the holes in the uh, disk to see that it's in. And that you can you can add a little drop of contact cleaner to that, and most of the times that fixes that problem. Well, I know Ravi and I recently we've had some uh, CRT issues, haven't we, Ravi? Yeah, yeah. I was I was going to ask about CRTs and like. Uh... And they're quite scary to get into, aren't they? And stuff. Uh, it's it's not for it's, your your kind of standard computer user uh, repairs on CRTs, are they? I think if you know what you're doing, I'm not. I'm not particularly uh, fond of working on CRTs. I'm still afraid of them, really. Even though I know I, I read a lot about them, I talked to people who uh, repaired CRTs professionally, and I think I I know what to do to be safe working on them, but I still am afraid of the high voltages. Yeah, so basically, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, don't touch CRTs, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, which kind of like cool mods have you seen and stuff to to, to kind of you know replace like drives or 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 change power supplies or kind of add modern components in there that are going to help save the older machines oh there's so many things um there's like especially for the commodore 64 because it's so popular there's so many add-ons and things um i'm i'm in the process still of building a commodore 64 with as many replacement parts as possible and there is like there's the circuit board. There is new uh, replica circuit boards for the Commodore 64 for many other systems as well. Now that you can just order circuit boards from a manufacturer, <laughs> like as a private person, that's pretty cool. And there are there are like um, newly made chips, replacement chips that use microcontrollers for the SID chip, the sound chip. And uh, I'm just in the process of testing a replacement for the graphics chip in the Commodore 64. That's pretty cool with a native HDMI out and things like that. <laughs> that's going to be amazing when that's finished. Yeah, there's basically, there's so many things and you can have like uh, for, for replacing disk drives, there's a lot of options like the GoTech drives that are really popular and not that expensive that basically replace every kind of drive that you would ever want. And you can read things like disk files from a USB stick, really handy to have. And I think as well, you know, you mentioned that about, you know, replacing um, chips and stuff too. And a lot of these um, ICs that were made back in the 80s and early 90s, a lot of them were custom. And some of them are really hard to find. I mean, you know, going back to the Commodore 16, for example, I know the the CPU on that, infam you know, it's infamous for failing, yeah. you know, because it burns out and it's really bad. But now people are actually doing replacement EEPROM versions of them as well. So it's great when these hard to find, hard to source original parts have new alternatives, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And that's yeah, that's the only option these days to have like a, a halfway original system and just replace the part that fails with a new one. Yeah, most of the old there there there's going to be a point where all the old custom ICs are just failing. They are just failing. They are just aging, and uh, at some point they are going to fail. I think because they're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just be replacing our systems bit by bit yeah. each year. <laughs> <Based on that. laughs> Well, let's talk about your collection then, Jan. I mean, what? how many machines have you got? I mean, what, what's your collection kind of like and uh, how do you store it all? Oh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I I don't consider myself a collector, but I guess I am at this point. I have so many machines uh, just sitting everywhere. I have I have the problem that I acquire, mostly I get uh, like broken machines and fix them. And as soon as I've worked on them, I, I kind of built a relationship with the machine and can't let go of it. <laughs> <laughs> And I have like, yeah, I don't know how many C64s, especially I have like 10, 11, 12, I don't know, many, many C64s that are working and a couple of broken ones that are not working. But yeah, I eventually have to get to the point where I sell stuff, I guess, but <laughs> can't let go yet. I'm, I'm running out of room. I'm in, like in a um, two and a half uh, room flat here. And the half room is like my retro lab room. <laughs> and that's really, really small. I'm just, I'm using vertical storage going up the walls with some, some little uh, storage. And it's, you know, it's, it's weird that the cool. more, the more space you have, the more you fill though. Is I built a, I built a new room recently and it's already, <laughs> I've, I've been in here about two weeks and it's nearly full already. <laughs> yeah, you guys need to minimalize. Like <laughs> yeah. you, you'd be the worst uh, retro salesman, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah like resellers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was wondering, 
it, is there a, is a system that you'd really like to get in your collection and uh, or an area that you haven't explored before oh yeah there's there's a couple that i don't have at all like i would really like to get more uh cpc things i only have a 464 at this point but i really like that system and i never really experienced it back in the day most of the systems i wanted uh i have already i guess there's some like some rare stuff but i'm not really interested i'm not i'm not that much interested in in consoles and things like that although i have a couple like an x uh, 68000 would be something i would like to have <laughs> what, what about know. um classic mac would would you a classic mac i have that? i actually have a couple i have all the ones <laughs> i want <laughs> actually yeah like a really classic like an apple II. i don't even have an apple II. that would be a system that i would really like to have but they are big and clunky and <laughs> take up a lot of room well what made you decide to you know get a camera out and stop recording this stuff it was really um, the other videos I watched and uh, learned so much from. And I, uh, I did, as I said, I w- I'm self-taught in electronics, basically. And I learned a lot from YouTube and uh, trying to figure out things myself after watching videos. And I just um, came to a point where I, I got some, some ideas were my own ideas at that point, And I wanted to share them. And uh, as you probably know, the retro computer community is... Uh, yeah, a magnif- magnificent place to be and to share ideas. And yeah, that's how it started. It just felt good to share knowledge with others and be part of a community and uh, contribute to that uh, in a small way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, you know, it's a great resource, YouTube. You know, you've got stuff like, um, you know, I'm thinking of channels I watch, you know, obviously as well as yours, um, like Adrian's Digital Basement. You've got um, Gadget UK on there as well. Yeah. It does really good repair videos, you know, Eve, V-Blog, you know, there are some great resources on there. I mean, were there any channels that you kind of, that influenced you that you looked up to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the the first channel that I thought was really, in, as, like, I learned a lot from Gadget UK, definitely. Yeah. That was the first channel I watched for learning about retro computers. Before I got into, into computers, I was more... Uh, I, I was specializing in audio equipment and things coming from my audio engineering days. I was uh, restoring vintage amplifiers and things like that. And I watched a lot of channels uh, about that and learned a lot about the electronics of those machines. And then I got in by accident, I bought a C64 off eBay. That's how my, I made a video about repairing that and got so much help from the community that I kind of uh, stayed in that lane. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it takes one machine and then yeah. all of a sudden you've got a collection of about 100 yeah, yeah. it was kind of sad but also great <laughs> well you do some res- restoration of like trash pickups and stuff um wh- what what kind of things have you found and like what's been the craziest kind of i think the craziest the craziest thing the craziest thing i found was an oscilloscope on the side of the road that got <laughs> kicked around by some kids when i came home from work and I was just getting into electronics and really couldn't afford an oscilloscope. <laughs> and I saw them kicking around some device that looked like an oscilloscope. And I went to them and uh, said, hey, what's that? <laughs> and it turns out somebody just uh, put it on the side of the road to throw it away. And I picked it up. It was really dirty, but I cleaned it up and it works. <laughs> and it still works. Like a 70s Philips oscilloscope, very basic from today's perspective, but it was an oscilloscope working one that I just found. <laughs> it's retro now. Yeah, it's, it's cool. really it's really cool. It's like an analog <laughs> scope, which is really looks really nice, really cool. <laughs> well, I've seen you know, in your videos that you've got some really interesting equipment. I mean, you know, like I said to you before, you know, I've always wanted to be able to do it. You know, I, my soldering skills are terrible. Um, I've got a soldering iron and a, an air gun and stuff like that, but <laughs> don't know how to use them all that well. I mean, what kind of setup and equipment do you use? And is there any kind of essential tools to doing these repairs that you, you suggest people get hold of? Uh, you need uh, definitely, speaking of soldering irons, um, get a good one, definitely. I had like a very, very cheap one in the beginning and it was really hard to work with that and now i got like uh, a better one an old one but better one like a weller station 
that I bought off eBay used. And that works so much better because it's uh, temperature controlled and uh, really has the temperature sensor. That's the important part. <laughs> and uh, it works so much better. And um, I can also recommend getting a desoldering station. Like there are pretty inexpensive ones. If you want to, if you have ever tried desoldering uh, an IC, like 40 leg IC or something like that, without a desoldering station, just with a hand soldering pump or solder wick or something like that, you are going to love a, a desoldering station. It makes things so much easier. <laughs> and they sound cool as well, don't they? Yeah, they make this sound super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Satisfying. Um, what, what, what's the kind of like best recycling a retro gear you've seen or like you know some people call it upcycling or or kind of re-implementing re uh, retro gear into something different there are some people who use stuff for really like work tasks but very few i think one thing that that i do that i find myself doing more often is uh like playing games on the old machines instead of going to a new console i don't own any uh recent console <laughs> and i'm not very interested I, I try from time to time i try to load a new pc game and try to play that but I'm, i get dist distracted so quickly and the old games are just mostly so casual <laughs> that you can just start a game and just play a bit and then go do something else i always basically always have an old computer set up uh, next to my modern computer so I can always, if the modern computer is rendering a video or something, or I'm uploading something and it takes forever, I can always go and play a little game of Gianna Sisters on the Commodore 64 or something like that. <laughs> so that's something I use those machines for every day, I guess. Yeah, and I think you're right as well, because a lot of modern games require so much time yeah. being pumped into them, don't they? Yeah. Even yeah, I mean, tutorials. there is this this, yeah. this trend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is this trend with the casual games, like on on your phone and things like that. But yeah, I like the the old games. I have another feeling to them, I guess. I always find it interesting as well when people are using retro machines for modern tasks. I mean, I was reading. I don't know if you saw the story that's around last week. Eric Roth, who's you know the writer of Dune, turns out that he writes all his screenplays using. Um, an old MS DOS program. Yeah, I saw from that 1990. Too. Yeah. That's super yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah cool things like that are like. super cool. Or like um, the the uh, Atari STs um, coming from the audio world. They were used as MIDI machines, like way in the the mid 2000s, I guess. They were still used as the standard MIDI setup, MIDI controllers, sequencers, and things like that. It's yeah, and I think that there's some guy using one on a on a, a campsite we saw recently. We we're talking about, weren't we, Ravi? A guy runs yeah. his, his entire campsite on an Atari ST still today. It's <laughs> crazy when people are still using them. And I actually like the fact that people are still, you know, finding uses for these old machines because you probably see the same. There are some people that are like, you know, transforming Power Mac G5s into like benches or they're turning a, a, a Power Mac G4 into a, an aquarium. And it always breaks my heart a bit when yeah. I see them getting used for stuff like that. Yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hate that. Well, you know, in terms of keeping our retro machines working great and looking great as well, I mean, this is obviously something that I know divides the retro community. What do you think of retro brighting? <laughs> What's kind of your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, that's... Uh... That's kind of a political issue, I guess. Um, I'm a fan of retro writing, but I know a lot of people aren't. And uh, it is kind of a destructive process, I guess. But if you do it carefully, I have like a method that takes a lot of time. And uh, I, I go in and look at my part that I'm retro writing every half an hour or something and make sure that it, I don't over bright it or over uh, bleach it. And I'm really careful with that. And still sometimes things uh, turn out worse than they were. But most of the times the machines look like new. And even if it's just for a brief uh, couple of months or something, I think it's totally worth it. <laughs> Restoring something and like seeing the, the, the original beige color of it or something. <laughs> you know, it's weird because I've got some systems that I retro brighted maybe a decade ago. Yeah. And they still look they still look great. There's some I did last year that have gone yellow again. It's it's very inconsistent. Yeah, it's super it's super different with different plastic mixes and things like that. The the chemics are the chemicals are different. I don't know. There's so much uh, science behind that. But mostly it works for in my experience it works at least for a couple of years. The machines look good 
and then they slowly start yellowing again at some point depending on how you use them and how much they are exposed to sunlight and things like that i guess well i, I saw that you did um the vicky 20 which is a kind of vic 20 pcb replacement what 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 do you think about these new replica pcbs and uh what what did you think of that project as well that's i think it's super fun to build these but there's of course there's the downside that you have to use some of the custom chips that there are no replacement chips for yet so no modern replacements so you basically have to like slaughter a working or some non-working machines to get all the custom chips at this point in time which is kind of sad and yeah and it's it's very rare that you that you get a broken circuit board from a wick, wick 20 or something that you can just um salvage all the parts from and put them on a new circuit board. Basically, it's just it's um, salvaging parts from halfway working machines to be able to build a new one. So, yeah. Well, what do you think of these new Amiga ones that have, like, you know, new upgrades in them and, and kind of new standards put on them? That's, yeah, I think that those, um, those make more sense because there's a lot, especially for the Amigas that had these uh, electrolytic capacitors in them that leaked there's a lot of boards that got damaged by those capacitors. And for those boards, it definitely makes sense to just uh, pick the custom chips off them and put them on a new board. And if that board has some add-ons added on, <laughs> it's not a bad thing, I think. Yeah, that's... And there are lots of them out there, aren't there? I mean, there's like the, the Re-Amiga 3000. Uh, um, the Phoenix John 1K gone. as well. There's loads, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and there's... I saw there's, you know, there's some people are doing, um, there's an Apple One kind of clone that you can build yourself. Yes. That I've seen. There's like an, an Altair <laughs> kit that you can make now. There's a lot. Is there any, any that you've seen that are really cool? Yeah, there's like the, the ZX, uh, the, the Sinclairs, ZX81 clones and things like that have been around for quite a while, I think. And th those are, it's it's really rewarding to, to build something that in the end is a computer. In, in the best case, of course. <laughs> or you can troubleshoot it until it becomes a computer. <laughs> yeah, a bit more, more what I do if I ever get it working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was actually um, with the w Wiki 20 board, I was really surprised it worked like first try. I, I sold it everything mm. and it worked first when I first turned it on. Didn't happen last time when I built a C64 clone. <laughs> yeah, it's very rewarding when it works first, first time, yeah, I imagine. that was kind of amazing. <laughs> Kind of surprising as well. <laughs> well, tell us about the um, the flood that you had. Because I know you did a video um, reviving the Amiga on your channel. What kind of happened there, and how did you go about reviving it? Yeah, there was like a like a flood in uh, the western southwestern part of Germany a couple of months ago now, which was pretty. It, it rarely happens. Uh, there was like heavy rainfall, and uh, many basements got flooded, and some homes were destroyed completely, and things like that. And I got contacted by a person whose basement was flooded, which was uh, full of his retro collection, basically. And all the systems got water damaged. I actually have a couple more that I need to work on. And yeah, the, basically, it's not it's not only water. It's just dirty, muddy water that flows through the systems and everything is encrusted. <laughs> so yeah, I cleaned everything thoroughly, took everything apart. That there's like there's like corrosion going on, of course, rust on the metal parts and corrosion on the traces and things like that. The two th systems I worked on, uh, Commodore 64 and an Amiga 1200, so far they looked pretty good, actually, given the fact that they were basically underwater for a period of time. <laughs> but most of them should be salvageable, the systems I got, because, yeah, in the end you can wash away the dirt and clean everything most things are waterproof on these boards i think has that been your hardest um restoration or, or, or has there been other stuff that's been a lot more challenging oh i think th those restorations they, they were tedious to do because you have to take everything every last bit apart but um they were not the worst stuff i've seen yeah i've actually i i'm still in the process of um the worst stuff I've seen basically is like battery leakage and things like that, where like the whole board, um, many, many traces are eaten away by some battery uh, acid or something. Those are really challenging. I'm still working on an Amiga 4000 
that I got ages ago. <laughs> There's going to be a video eventually when I get somewhere with that. But uh, that got uh, a lot of battery damage and leaky capacitors. And yeah, there's a lot of traces that you have to rewire, basically. Oh, yeah, the nightmares. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's thousands. tedious. Yeah. It's tedious, tedious work. But it's worth it in the end. You got uh, ideally a working Amiga 4000. <laughs> I've seen them in, you know, those old um, PCs have got them, you know, particularly ninety early 90s PCs have got those barrel batteries yeah. on there and uh, Acorn Archimedes and there's a few models of that that have got them in there as well. So often there can be a, t- a ticking time bomb going off in there. If you, if you don't get them off the board, it can cause all kinds of nightmares. Yeah, and they are, they're really bad. They are really destructive. Like in the, the old, the early uh, Macintosh uh, systems also have those batteries mm. and they are, sometimes they're really badly corroded. And not even not to a point where they are no longer fixable in any reasonable way, I guess. Well, I loved your video on um, uh, saving DVDs and CDs as well, <laughs> um, because I remember back in the days we'd try to like save stuff, and you know you'd be teenagers and it'd be like toothpaste, and there'd all be these kind of rumors of of stuff that you can use. So, so what do you kind of recommend uh, is is a way of saving CDs and DVDs? Yeah, I did, that was quite interesting because that was something I just wanted to try myself because similar to your experience back in the day, we tried stuff and it, nothing worked, basically. We had this this rumor that you could just put them in the freezer for some time and they yeah, would yeah. repair themselves and things. Yeah, but uh, what I basically did is use some, some polishing paste and just um, some uh, very light sandpaper and basically remove the layer of plastic that has the scratches on it and uh, polish it uh, to, to a bright, shiny surface. And that worked, actually. But that's a tedious process that, that, that takes some time. There's there's machines that do that, actually, like CD, DVD polishing machines. <laughs> but of course, uh, I don't have one and I just tried it mechanically <laughs> and it works. Yeah, it, it seems to work. And I do remember, like, you, you'd take them to, like, the good expensive shops and they'd have a nice polishing machine yeah. or you'd buy a cheap kind of polishing machine yourself which would never never actually work in the end yeah i've seen i've seen some videos where people were just uh building some rig on their uh cordless drill or something and uh using that to polish <laughs> things that works as well i don't know uh, <laughs> your imagination is the limit <laughs> <laughs> because I've got some, you know, old systems when you've got a, a drive um, that might actually do a, you know, a ring on the disc. I've had that before, you know, and it t- makes a big scratch in a circle around the middle Ooh, of the disc. Yeah. yeah, so there can be some pretty nasty ones. But I think I actually did it. I took that to a, a game store and they had a polishing machine actually fixed it. So it does seem like, you know, a lot of them you might think are beyond repair are actually salvageable, I guess. Yeah, I think there's, there's quite some uh, material there that you can take away. There's there's like a mm. large or yeah a millimeter I think it is <laughs> on a CD of a uh, translucent material that you can scrape away, <laughs> and polish. You mentioned um, CRT monitors before. I mean, before we talked about restoring them. In terms of using them, I know you said you kind of got into the retro stuff with that C64. I know you use CRTs now in in your videos. And um, do you kind of think it's important to use CRTs to have that old school experience to make it feel authentic? Yeah, I think. Nothing beats a real CRT, although the the upscalers you can get uh, nowadays are really good. Um, When I started making videos, I had like a really cheap uh, upscaler and that had uh, a terrible lag. And I didn't even notice it had lag because I was used to emulators that had lag. lag. (laughs) And when I first got a a CRT back, uh, it was kind of a whole different thing games played differently and things like that because you don't it everything looks differently i remember a video you did then about uh crts like comparing uh the crt like the the color bleeding and things like that how things look yeah. much smoother the graphics were designed yeah, the, for crts in the end so yeah so like anti-aliasing almost isn't yeah. it because it, it blurs them yeah. yeah and that makes that makes games look completely different actually and and the, there's like emulators for scan lines and things but it's not the same it doesn't look quite the same <laughs> i'm a fan of crts <laughs> yeah me too it's a better well, overall nostalgia is much uh, better with crts <laughs> what do what do you kind of think of these fpga projects and like implementing uh older systems on on an fpga 
Yeah, that's super cool, actually. I like that a lot. Um, I'm more, it's not, not really my thing <laughs> because I'm more into repairing things on a component level and, and things like that. But I uh, actually have a, a Mist FPGA, the predecessor to the Mister, I think. And that can do like a C64, an Amiga, an Atari, everything you want in FPGA. And that's, uh, yeah, it's not really emulation. It's emulation on a hardware level. I don't know how the scientific term for that is, but you get the, the exact same picture output from the uh, RGB out or the composite out that you would get from a real system. And that's pretty amazing. That's actually, and I compared it on a CRT and on a, on another monitor and uh, to the original machines. And that's, it's really accurate. It's, it's the same output basically. That's pretty amazing. So if you don't want, if you don't have a lot of room <laughs> and still want to experience the old machines, that's a good way to do it. I love as well that, you know, you've done a couple of videos like the, um, the Game Boy IPS screen replacement video that you did. And, you know, for handhelds, a lot of those older ones now, you know, the displays look really bad on them. I mean, are there any kind of good modifications? Obviously, there's that one that you mentioned there. Any other ones that we, we should look out for? Oh, I think there's for, for nearly all the handhelds, there are now uh, modern, like, IPS screen replacements. And they are all so much better <laughs> than the original screens. Especially the ones for the... I saw the one for the Atari Lynx. Yeah, There's some really good replacement. The, the original screen is just utter crap <laughs> on those ones, and uh, the replacement screens make make them a whole new experience. And uh, the same with the Game Gears and everything that has a color screen basically benefits uh, hugely from <laughs> new replacement screens. The old Game Boys, yeah, of course, the the old screens were horrible as well. And it's crazy when you only look at a modern display on them. It's just, so I've, I've got an Atari Lynx and I've got to kind of angle it about 90 yeah. degrees and, you know, just see the colors on it and stuff. It's crazy. But you see them with new displays and they just look kind of how you imagine they looked in your memory, even though they never actually did. Yeah, that's how they looked on the, on the like, on the box art and things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how they sold them. Yeah, but I was really surprised. I, I actually use my Game Boy, uh, like my original Game Boy now, a, a whole lot more than before with the original screen. It's just so much easier on the eyes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've, I've seen you've done other collabs. Well, it's kind of like roundtable chats with um, other YouTubers and stuff. Uh, uh, are there any people you'd like to collab with? Yeah, basically, we are pretty well organized now, I think, in the YouTube retro world. We're all... I'm in contact with a lot of people, I guess. And uh, yeah, basically, everybody is organizing things and... Uh, Everybody is invited to participate. We have these these uh, occasional the, the, these uh, themed month like September, DOS, December, <laughs> things like that. There's plans for more. It's basically an open thing. Everybody who wants to participate can participate and be part of the gang. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, they're always fun. I think to take part in as well. It's, again, like you mentioned, that it's an excuse for people to do things, isn't it? Yeah. You know. <laughs> Totally. Put a bit of time into them, which is great. Um, well, your channel at the moment, I mean, obviously I'll link it up in our show notes. I mean, you've been doing the uh, series on saving the the C64 and the A1200 from the flood, um, upgrading the Amiga 600 recently as well. I love the fact that, you know, you can be honest as well. You've got the uh, the vintage amplifier re-repair after you blew it up. You oh, know, yeah. You're not afraid to say <laughs> if you made a mistake, which is great. Um, is there anything we should look, look out for? Anything that you're working on at the moment that's coming up on the channel soon? Oh, the next, I'm actually working on the video about the VIC-2, the Commodore 64 graphics chip replacement. I'm testing a prototype of that. That's really interesting. That's going to be a game changer. <laughs> I don't know if the video is going to be any good, but I'm testing that. And it's a really interesting FPGA-based replacement for the video chip of the C64. Fantastic. Well, listen, Yang, keep up the great work on the channel. You know, some invaluable advice there as well. Everyone should go and check it out, you know, for some tips on keeping your old systems going and just some great upgrades as well. And, you know, I love your passion in your videos as well. So uh, long may it continue. And thank you so much for coming on and being our guest this week. Thank you for having me. <laughs>